Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see so many people here joining us today for another CORE Coffee Chat. Uh, I'm Nicole Young, and I'm one of the co-facilitators for CORE Investments, and I'll explain what CORE is in just a moment. And I'm joined today by my colleague, you want to Nicole Lezen. Welcome, everyone. I'm thankful that you're all here. And um, we co-host this series of core coffee chats and occasionally these longer core conversations as just one way for us all to learn together and build shared knowledge uh, and really try to inspire collective action across the community through this structure that we call the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. And that's really just a broad umbrella for offering both new and existing training and capacity building opportunities that supports the mission and vision of CORE, which again, I'll explain in just a moment. But we're very pleased to be joined this morning by Rainy Perez from the County of Santa Cruz. She's the Homeless Services Coordinator. And um, so today we're gonna hear from Rainy about the Housing for Healthy Santa Cruz, which is a new strategic framework for addressing homelessness in Santa Cruz County. So we'll hear an overview from Rainey and then there'll be time for questions and answers from all the participants. Um, we're also joined today by Kate Bristol and Catherine Gale from Focus Strategies. They're not actually going to be presenting today, but they're here. They'll be available to help answer questions um, when we get to that point later on, but they are national experts in homeless response systems and facilitated the process that you're about to hear about today. So we're very fortunate to have them joining us today as well. And as Nicole Lezen mentioned, um, we wanna thank Stella Lauerman, our colleague who's part of our core team for providing the simultaneous interpretation today. Stella, do you wanna wave just for everybody to see you on camera? Here we go. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen now. I have, let's see, make sure that my slides are up. During all that prep time, I was the one that did not <laughs> get my slides ready. <laughs> so, let me just switch there. Everybody seeing my slides? Okay. And so before we get started, um, for those of you that may have joined right after Nicole gave that uh, great little Zoom tour, just wanna make sure everybody knows how to participate uh, today. So again, because we are offering simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, we wanna make sure everyone is on the right uh, language channel. So look at your screen or um, on your phone, you have to tap the, the more with the three dots to select your language channel. So look for the globe icon and select either English or Spanish. So pick one, one channel or the other. Um, it'll then change to an icon that has either EN for English or ES for Spanish. Uh, if you are listening on the Spanish channel, then you'll wanna click that icon again so that you can select uh, the option to mute the original audio so you're not hearing both the English speaker and the Spanish speaker at the same volume. And then we do want uh, everyone to, or ask everyone to rename themselves in the participant list. So click on the participant icon to open that up and then rename yourself. So you'll either hover your mouse over your name or tap on your name if you're on a phone um, you might have to click more to get to the rename option, but then once you do, we want you to add either ENG, if you're listening on the English channel, ESP for Spanish or Espanol, or BIL if you're bilingual and might be switching back and forth. It just helps us to know, especially when we get to the uh, questions and answers, whether um, we have any Spanish participants. And then the last thing is Nicole <clears throat> mentioned there are different ways to interact with us during the session, particularly if you wanna get our attention and, and you have a question to ask, uh, click on the blue hand to raise your hand and, and get our attention. And feel free to keep asking questions and share your comments in the chat, including if you didn't get a chance to already uh, share with us what you're thankful for. That was our little icebreaker question. Okay, so as I mentioned, Nicole and I are the co-facilitators for something that's called CORE, which stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And it's a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County. 
using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. So this really came out of the county and city of Santa Cruz um, a few years ago when they made the decision to modify their funding model for funding safety net services provided by nonprofits. And so they uh, adopted and developed this results-based collective impact funding model. But really over the last few years, based on input and insights from many different partners in local government, nonprofits, philanthropy, different community groups, uh, we've grown CORE into much more than just a funding model and a way of, of allocating resources. It's become a much broader movement, um, as I mentioned. And uh, the mission and vision statements that are on this slide, which really uh, are focused on collective action and creating an equitable, thriving, resilient community with you know, equity front and center, that all came from, again, the input and participation of many different partners over the last couple of years. And so we really take that to heart and try to keep that at the center of everything that we do. And when we talk about equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan, across all parts of our community, uh, should have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. And that we don't want to see that people's opportunities and their life outcomes can be predicted for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income, le income level, gender identity, uh, sexual orientation, or any other kind of social identity. And so when we talk about CORE as both a funding model and a movement, really we're talking about CORE providing a framework to align different people's and organizations' priorities and programs, policies and funding and results around community-wide goals and impacts that we're all working together to try to achieve that create these core conditions for health and well-being. And today's topic <clears throat> on housing for a healthy Santa Cruz is actually a great example of how all these core conditions are so connected to one another um, because as we all know, without affordable, safe, stable shelter and housing, it's much more difficult to achieve health and well-being in any of the other core conditions like health and wellness or economic security and mobility or community connectedness. And likewise, the risk of being unhoused or unsheltered is often connected to challenges and barriers that are experienced in other core conditions like things like mental illness or economic security social isolation, intimate partner violence, uh, or racism, you know, just to name a few. And again, equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to be willing to examine and address our individual, organizational, and systemic beliefs, practices, and structures that perpetuate the very inequities that we're often um, set out to eliminate. So that's part of our ongoing work as we um, talk about making an impact together. And if you haven't already, we wanna encourage you to check out the new core results menu on DataShare. And so you'll see the URL, the uh, hyperlink for the website at the bottom of the screen. Um, this is something that we just launched last month. So it's still really new and it's still what we call a prototype. So there'll be ongoing improvements to it. Um, but DataShare itself is a website that has a lot of different local, state, and national data that you can look at in different ways that give you a sense of how our community is doing in different aspects of health and well-being. And we've created this interactive core results menu that organizes that data in DataShare based on the eight core conditions for health and well-being. And then in each core condition, there's a set of community impact statements that we developed again in collaboration with many other people. Um, we often call these uh, community-wide results uh, as well as impacts. And then for each impact statement, we've developed or identified a number of community level indicators or types of data that if we were to look at it, if that data is available, again, starts to paint a picture of how we're doing in terms of different aspects of health and well-being in our community. Um, when it's available, if that, if that data is available in ways that you can look at it based on race and ethnicity and age and things like that, uh, that's also available. So I mentioned this because, not only because we want to encourage everyone to 
explore and look at the core results menu, but because Rainey and Kate and Catherine were three of the many people who contributed their wisdom, their expertise as we were drafting the community impact statements and the indicators and provided a lot of really helpful feedback and recommendations to us, um, particularly around what kind of data actually is available. And so you'll hear uh, them mention some of those types of indicators, which again, are reflected in our core results menu. So it's just another example of what we mean by aligning uh, multiple initiatives and multiple efforts. Um, and so we are very happy to be part of the uh, launch and gathering of community input on the new uh, strategic framework for addressing homelessness. And so let me, uh, before I turn it over to Rainey, I just wanna introduce her. So again, Rainey Perez is the Homeless Services Coordinator for the County of Santa Cruz. Rainey is also a member of the core steering committee. So again, we've had um, the opportunity to work with Rainey now for a few years and, and uh, had a lot of opportunity to look at different ways that our work intersects. And so we are very pleased to have her here. And so Rainey is going to, again, give us an overview of this new strategic framework, and then we'll open it up for questions um, that Rainey and Catherine and Kate will help answer. Rainey, Thank go you. ahead and turn it over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nicole, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here to learn about this new strategic framework. Uh, this is a draft that we'll be introducing, and uh, we're entering into a period of public comment. So I want to um, ensure that everybody knows that this is not a final product that you'll be looking at, but rather one that we want to get some community input on. So I'm going to share my screen. And can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. CC. Say again? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, what we're going to do is an overview of the presentation first, just kind of how we got here, um, and then a summary of the framework itself, next steps on our community input process, and then some time for questions and discussions. Um, so how we got here is through a fairly long period of time with working with our community partners and um, sort of thinking about why did we even undertake this? So when we look at why would we update our framework, we think about what are our current um, homeless numbers looking like and how, are, how have we been doing with regard to the strategic framework that we already had. Um, this slide shows you in terms of per capita homeless, this, this left side shows you um, that the state average is 40 homeless persons per 10,000 residents. Um, for Santa Cruz County, we're at almost 80, 79.3. And you know, so we're above the state average. And then the county of Santa Cruz has a few comparison counties that we look at. And if we look at their low and high, um, you can see the 19 and the 125. So you know, we're right in the middle, but still our numbers are very high. Our per capita homelessness is very high. And we have um, various subpopulations, some which are experiencing unsheltered rates of homeless at a higher degree than others um, among our uh, homeless population, 85% of the veterans responded as still unsheltered in our 2019 point in time count. Um, so anyway, these are just kind of some, some overview numbers that give you a sense. And then here's a look at the process and the timeline that we undertook. So we began our work with focus strategies in April of 2019, or perhaps it was March, and we undertook a community engagement process that involved interviewing numerous stakeholders, doing a baseline system assessment to kind of gauge where are we at. Um, and that was more of a qualitative assessment. Um, from that, we developed some interim recommendations that we've been implementing over the last year. And then in phase two of this engagement with focus strategies, we really started diving into the data. We were looking at the system and the project performance. Um, some of the um, homeless services agencies that are on this call today will remember looking at your data and doing really a deep dive to see how are your projects performing? How are we doing in terms of lengths of stay and uh, exits to housing and so forth? 
From there, we also developed some implementation working groups to uh, tackle some very specific issues and develop recommendations around diversion, coordinated entry, housing focused shelter, and some other areas. Um, then came along the COVID-19 pandemic. We were just ready to engage in a very robust community process around this framework, the strategic framework, and we had to pause and pivot to responding to COVID and think about some online ways to get community input. Um, so now we are still ongoing pandemic and now we're in the final phase of this engagement with focus strategies where we're looking at um, the strategic framework, kind of what will we do over the next three years that's really gonna make a difference. And then um, how does the community respond to that? Does that sit right with folks? Um, do it, does it have the right focuses? And, and I guess what I would say is that we're not looking to change the plan uh, profoundly. We're looking, is it clear? Is it actionable? Does it have things spelled out you know, in a, in a very clear, measurable way? <clears throat> is it understandable? So between now and um, probably towards the end of December, we'll be doing community comment um, with the goal of bringing a final plan back uh, for adoption in January. So <clears throat> the inclusive and collaborative approach I talked about has involved our homeless action partnership, the cities, the county of Santa Cruz, um, the homeless services coordination office that I have been um, part of for the last five years is officially not uh, in existence anymore. As of last Friday, we have a new Housing for Health division in the Human Services Department that stood up yesterday. So we're officially in a new, a new team environment there. We also have a project advisory group that committed a lot of hours and support to shaping this work and responding to, um, you know, questions about community engagement, um, how we message things. Um, and then there's all of you, community stakeholders, service providers, people with lived experience. We've done focus groups, we've done community meetings. So this has been a very, very inclusive collaborative approach. Uh, and we wanna make sure that this final phase is also. Key findings from our earliest assessments included that we had some really great elements. <clears throat> um, we had um, a coordinated entry system in place. We already had some existing outreach shelters, um, some targeted housing for high needs, um, but we need to develop those further. Um, some immediate gaps included uh, diversion, housing focused shelter, our rapid rehousing exits have been um, less than desirable for our overall community and also our permanent supportive housing exits. And part of that is our um, our inventory of rapid rehousing slots. Some of that is our housing market. There's lots of reasons, um, but we have identified barriers that we think we can address. Um, and we need to continue to our progress towards a governance structure. Some of you know that this has been a stop and start effort over the last few years, but this is an, uh, embedded in this plan that we would do this um, improved governance structure. And then I think really importantly, pivoting to data. And this comes back to the data exchange that Nicole was talking about. We want to use our data really robustly. In the past, it's been underutilized. We now believe that we will be able to um, build a dashboard, get reports, track the data, pay attention to the data, use it to inform decisions. And then staffing capacity has been insufficient. You may all know that for most of the last five years, there was just one staff person myself in the Homeless Services Coordination Office. A year ago, we added an additional staff. We've had significant support from Assistant CAO uh, Elisa Benson, but the office hasn't had sufficient staffing and uh, going forward uh, in this new Housing for Health division, Rainy, you're muted. Hey, Rainy, you, you accidentally got muted. Do I need to repeat anything? I don't know how I got muted. Okay, so you got, you got muted at the end of the last slide. Um, I think we'll just move on. 
Um, so housing for, the, for a healthy Santa Cruz, a summary of this framework. We have um, a vision and guiding principles, some very specific goals, strategies and key objectives, uh, six month work plans that will support the actual implementation, and then some resource needs and assumptions. And within each of these strategies, I want to point out, we have some very specific key objectives. Not all of those are shown in this PowerPoint presentation, um, but I will give you some examples when we get to that. So overall, overarching goals of this program are to reduce unsheltered homelessness by 50%. This is by January, 2024, and to reduce overall homeless by, homelessness by 30%. Um, this will be measured by our point in time counts and uh, we, you know, it's, these are stretch goals, we acknowledge that and especially in this time of COVID and with the fire having just happened, some of these assumptions, you know, we're making them not knowing how much of an impact COVID and the fire will have had on our ability to get this done, but we're moving forward. In particular, we have a core goal of improving the effectiveness of all programs. And this has to do with looking at our data and looking at things like length of stay in shelter. The longer a stay is in a program, the fewer people it's serving and the longer that person's time experiencing homelessness. So strategies that we can undertake to reduce, reduce length of stay are, are very important. And we have some specific goals. You'll see that they are different between emergency shelter, transitional housing, rapid rehousing and permanent housing programs. Uh, but that's because these programs all have, you know, differing models and therefore differing lengths of stay. Uh, increasing the rehousing rate is really important and we're going to be introducing some strategies to do that. And then uh, last, increasing program entries from homelessness. So for example, people coming into an emergency shelter should be coming from a, an unsheltered situation rather than from a housed situation. Uh, so those are some measurable ways we're trying to improve effectiveness of programs and you'll see strategies that support this. Uh, another core goal is to expand, I'm sorry, to expand on the number of homeless response system beds or housing slots that are available. So we're looking at 160 year, year round emergency shelter beds and we are looking at 450 housing slots that includes 300 rapid rehousing and 100 permanent support, supportive housing slots. I'm happy to tell you that uh, we already have funded 200 of the rapid rehousing slots through a recent allocation that the state made of ESG CV funds. So uh, that's a, a very exciting development. Strategies, we have four major strategic areas. Uh, one is to better connect and serve. Uh, another is to increase housing options. We have a focus on prevention and problem solving and improving overall administration. So beneath each of these strategic areas, we have a number of specific goals. And then uh, we have our um, numerous objectives to do each of these areas. So if you see this, this first strategy, enhance and effectively target outreach, engagement, and temporary shelter resources is broken out into four sub-strategies um, where you can see that we're going to continue to ensure that shelters are safe and supportive. We're going to reduce barriers to shelter. We're going to ensure that shelters uh, residents of shelters are provided with case management, housing navigation, and other supports, um, and then develop capacity for health and housing focused street outreach. So in, uh, if I pick, for example, strategy, I want to look, read from my, from my plan, strategy 1.3, ensuring that folks are provided with case management and so forth. So we have the objectives beneath that, I just want to share an example, provide housing focused case management, housing navigation and other services, provide shelter residents uh, with access to flexible funding to help support rapid rehousing solutions, first and last month's rent, paying utility arrears or deposits. And the third objective is to track and report on movement from shelter to housing, including identifying and addressing racial and ethnic disparities in regaining housing. So I just want to give you a sense of 
how it how it layers the kind of Russian nesting doll approach to this. The second strategic area is to increase housing options, and this will be through developing or purchasing units, expanding the effectiveness of uh, rapid rehousing programs, developing a landlord engagement strategy, and implementing changes to coordinated entry that will support improved pace and effectiveness of housing exits. In the third strategic area, we have a focus on prevention and problem solving. Mm -hmm. And we want to implement system-wide housing problem solving. And again, this is, you know, you could say it's diversion, it's problem solving. It will rely on that flex funding that I spoke about just a moment ago. Um, and then also coordinating with other community and public entities to provide prevention assistance throughout the community. And one of our goals will be really deeply targeting prevention assistance to those most at need in order to serve those who are at the highest risk. Uh, the last strategic area is improving administration, uh, which in in includes implementing new governance, planning and communication action structures. So we have a new regional governance entity to stand up. Uh, we have uh, a goal of meaningfully engaging with people with lived experience. So for example, we've talked about standing up a new lived experience advisory group that would be part of the COC in the same way that the Youth Advisory Board is. And then uh, establishing and supporting the Housing for Health Division. That's the division I just spoke of. It's uh, officially stood up as of yesterday and uh, it consists of new director, Randy Ratner. He's the director of the Housing for Health Division and that's within Human Services. And there's a team currently of five people that report to Robert, including myself. Uh, and we've got some additional staffing coming on. The last strategy is developing and maintaining a commitment and capacity to become fully data informed. And this is something that's a reason why uh, this whole program is moving to the human services department. They have a very robust data analytics team and we have moved responsibility for the homeless management information system to this H4H team. And we have a business analytics team behind us that's assisting with all of the work around HMIS at this point. Um, so those are the, the, the key strategic areas. Um, there are some assumptions made about how we will be able to accomplish this because this is not work that the H4H team by themselves can stand up. We will be the administrative backbone for this plan, but there are things outside of our control that we, you know, that will affect our ability to achieve the goals in this plan. So um, assumptions are that the fires, pandemics, and elections don't you know, permanently impact our housing market, uh, especially for extremely low income households. And with regard to extremely low income households, it reminds me that this plan currently doesn't include an expansion of extremely low income affordable housing slots, but I think that the final version very well may. Um, it's a fine line between whether we include housing in this or not because it's a homeless plan, but having the goals around housing could help support the overall work of this plan. Uh, state and federal resources are very much key to our ability to achieve this plan. If there is a significant change or lack of state or federal resources, that could be a problem. Uh, we are assuming that this new H4H division will receive sufficient resources, whether that's staffing or funding. Uh, we just know that the team alone cannot do it. It will also rely on support from our outside partners. Um, we are assuming that partners will prioritize available funding for framework strategies. This means that um, all, jurisdic all jurisdictions within the COC would be looking to align their funding strategies around supporting this framework. We also are assuming that housing developers and service providers have capacity to carry out new or expanded programs. So if, for example, we can't find providers to do some of the new work that we're envisioning, that could either slow it down or jeopardize it. Um, locations are always a challenge, and so we're assuming that elected officials and community stakeholders will commit to identifying locations where these things can be done. 
And then last, that county departments, cities, businesses, and community members work together effectively. So this is, this is both an introduction of a plan and a call to action, because what we are anticipating is that success is going to require a great deal of collaboration. Um, here you see kind of a summary of what we need to do, um, also how we will do it. But we all need to get in this boat together and pick up our oars and row together. And if we can do that, if really everyone can and will get in the boat together, we believe that we can profoundly shift uh, the success of our response system. So I just want to conclude with next steps. We are in the process of introducing this framework to lots of groups, including yourself. Um, on November 10th, we did a board study session. We've done presentations to three city councils so far. We have one more this week. We are doing a community meeting tomorrow that will be a more in-depth uh, exploration of the plan. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, we will be doing an online survey. There will be, everybody's participating in these meetings will receive a link to uh, a web page where you can re read the complete framework, all of the supporting reports that went into the development of this, and complete a survey. So basically, we're in a period of open comment right now. We will, we will incorporate all of the public comment um, towards the end of December, and a final framework will be introduced for adoption in January. So now I would open it up for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Rainey. We have a couple questions in the chat and I encourage people to either share more or raise your hands with a little hand icon on the participants list. But for now, Rainey, we have a question from Father Joseph Jacobs about a barrier they've encountered for clients with Section 8 vouchers in terms of um, denial of housing based on credit reports and feeling that this is a discriminatory practice. Do you have any help or insights to offer there? That's a, a level of granularity that's not addressed in this plan. However, I think knowing, you know, we are, um, H4H is involved in a number of conversations in the coming weeks with Housing Authority. So I think if you could send a summary email about that concern to me, I will include that in our conversations with Housing Authority. I, th there are some policy issues that, you know, H4H and our team has no influence over, but that might be something where, in our landlord engagement strategy and in our work on sort of addressing system deficits, we can try to make some progress on something like that. Okay, great, thanks. And then Melissa had a question about whether the goals and steps included families with dependent children. She's concerned that households with children are more likely to be couch surfing and so building a system that requires them to become literally homeless um, increases trauma on a generational level and may extend the time when they're experiencing homelessness since it's more challenging for them to find private market housing than a family um, that a family with children could afford compared to a, a single individual. So I would say there? that that would fall under the prevention category when we're talking about deeply targeted prevention, because if they're not literally homeless, then, you know, they're not going to be served by some of the programs that we have, but if they are in a, you know, high risk, what is it, unstably housed situation, then they may be eligible for the prevention that we're talking about building up. So it's, you know, there's, there's the homeless response system for people who are actually homeless, and then there needs to be prevention for people who are not literally homeless. Okay. And then we have a terminology question about unsheltered homelessness versus overall homelessness. Can you clarify that? So unsheltered homeless would be someone who's sleeping in a place meant, uh, not meant for human habitation. It could be a street, it could be an abandoned building, it could be in a car. Um, sheltered homeless would be someone who is in a program in a shelter or otherwise housed. So in our community, when we do the point in time count out of our, I think, 2200 total homeless count in 2019, we had about 1,800 of those were unsheltered on the street or otherwise in a, in a place not meant for human habitation. Okay, thanks for that. I'm not seeing other questions in the chat. 
oh, here we go, from Surge. Will there be analyzing of data of clients being exited from programs due to behavior to ensure shelters are as low barrier as possible? There will be, um, that's a very, very um, down in the weeds question I don't quite know the answer to, but what I would say is that we are going to be looking very hard at our exits and we are also going to be looking at what barriers exist and we are also going to be doing an equity study. So if there are aspects of an equity study that people think are important to include, I mean, we're going to be following HUD guidance on an equity study and I don't actually know if something like that is included in the standard equity study of a system. But um, I think, you know, these are, these are great areas to provide feedback on. Okay. And then another uh, terminology question is, could you explain what rapid rehousing means? What yes. are the parameters for that? Yes. Rapid rehousing is a combination of um, usually case management, um, short-term rental assistance, and other a, a supports that might help somebody get into housing. So the idea is to very, very rapidly resolve their situation through a combination of short-term rental assistance that's often tapered off. Sometimes it starts with robust rental assistance in the beginning and then tapers down as someone is getting kind of back on their feet. Um, so it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a less expensive and more effective model than some of our other programmatic alternatives. Okay. And what about uh, common training for shelters to make sure that trauma-informed and harm reduction approaches are being implemented the same way? Those are things that I think, you know, we've done some amount of already in our community, just standardized training for our COC, and we will continue to do that. We are actually right now in conversations with Homebase about bringing in some additional technical assistance for our providers. And, you know, we've done some trauma-informed training in the past, but what I would say is that in general, and, and I would um, maybe lean on um, my partner, Brooke, who I see here in the room. Um, she's working a lot on our COVID-19 shelter system, and we are working towards developing some standardized protocols. You know, we have a bunch of different shelter providers, and all of them have different policies and procedures. And I think there is real interest, at least on the part of the H4H team and leadership, to, to move in the direction of a very standard model that, you know, we're not guessing from one shelter to another what their policies and procedures are and, and how, you know, what level of training staff have had and all of that. So these are sort of long range goals, I think, to standardize a whole shelter system. But I just want to say that I think that there's a desire to see movement in that direction. Okay, great. Brooke, I see you nodding. Do you want to add anything to that? Sure, yeah. I was just having a discussion at the in the evening last night with a shelter manager um, about sharing resources, and we're currently working on um, a compendium is too big a word, <laughs> but uh -huh. we're um, trying to put together a, a list of resources and sort of basic um, outlines that could be utilized across the shelter system. Um, like Rainey said, this is a work in progress and, and long term, I think we're going to have, you know, outcomes and measurements that we're seeking across the board, but um, we're going to do the best we can right right now because every shelter provider has different nuances to their programs and we're not mandating anything. We're just trying to offer support as best we can um, and ensure that we share information amongst those shelter providers so they're informed of the other um, programs and what's available. So if, if something isn't a good fit for them, perhaps somewhere else. So we're, we're just trying to get more transparent and um, and, and be a conduit for information sharing in this department. Okay. Great, so many works in progress, but lots of um, attempts to make things more consistent, it sounds like, and transparent at the same time. Um, Nicole, I think you have some reflective questions for, for Rainey and maybe for the Focus Strategies team as well. Well, and actually, we thought we, would, yeah. we thought we would, we um, thought we would just, since we have some time, um, Give everyone a chance to think about, you know, based on what you just heard Rainey sharing and describing about this uh, strategic framework, like what is it um, 
that you heard that excites you about that plan that, that gives you um, hope or or makes you excited about ooh about what's to come and kind of what you see might um, come out of that new strategic framework. So feel free if you want to add your comments, just thinking about again, based on what you heard, what did you really like? What excites you about it? Feel free to add something in the chat or if anyone wants to um, say something out loud, feel free to raise your hand, tap the blue hand or you can like signal to us in the camera and we'll try to Try to see that. Anything that particularly resonated with you that you thought, oh, that sounds like a really good direction to go or that you really like to see certain language in there or certain strategies. I know I really appreciate both the emphasis on um, the prevention and outreach aspect as well as the actual um, services and interventions as and then the kind of structure and the system that's really needed to to support all of that that was really well rounded really well balanced hey this Sergei. is serge um yeah, i have go ahead. you see me hey yes um the where where it said that the stakeholders would be the elected officials i think that's really huge for santa cruz um I continue to listen to Santa Cruz City Council and they refer to focus strategies like these reports and stuff, but their way of referring to it is, you know, the county's gonna follow focus strategies. Um, I think if there was something more direct towards what the cities could do, they wouldn't be able to use your report as a way of saying they don't have to do anything. So I really appreciate that that the, the municipalities as part of this effort. That's great. Thanks, Serge. And I think it really yeah. speaks to, you know, what Rainey was, that metaphor Rainey used earlier about like everybody getting in the same boat and all picking up our oars to, to run the same direction. Is there anything else you want to say in response to that, Rainey, about... Um, no, I just, I, I agree. I think it's really critically important. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's uh, it is a continued challenge to figure out what is a city role and what is a county role? It will, until there are, you know, mandates issued by either states or federal government, then I think it will remain a gray area and and there will still be um, finger pointing and people saying it's their, it's their responsibility. But this plan makes an effort to say, this is our responsibility. It's all of us together and no one entity can do this. And this, this plan says that. Um, we can't mandate <laughs> that anybody get on board, but we genuinely hope um, that everybody will, because if, if everybody does not, then collectively the system will be weaker. And Rainey, are you able to um, share? Or... Oh, go ahead, Serge. Oh, in the, in the section about increasing outreach, there was just a presentation, there was a study session at the S Santa Cruz City Council last night um, about outreach and cahoots, um, the kind of like nonprofit response instead of 911 response to homelessness. Mm -hmm. Would that be able to fit within the framework, the framework at some point? I think one of the ideas, sir, just that the street, so again, we've got some of the elements of this plan are funded right away. So we have funding right away from ESGCV, that's CARES Act funding, and the, the funding will pay for um, the 200 rapid rehousing slots I talked about. It will also pay for the ongoing supported operations of all of our COVID-19 shelters. And then it also is going to pay for this landlord um, engagement strategy that we've talked about in this plan, and it's going to cover three, I think it's 2.5 FTE street out, no, three, three FTE street outreach workers that are four countywide, and I believe one of the visions is that, that the, the street outreach worker, which has a focus on helping people get on a path to housing, not necessarily a health focus, but a housing focus, would be attached to this CAHOOTS team or some other street outreach team. I don't, that's a level of granularity that I haven't gotten involved in yet, but the vision is that 
it's a countywide street outreach complement that can work with the population that isn't working with case management in shelters. That makes sense. Thanks, Serge, and thanks, Rainey, for your response. Um, anybody else want to chime in about what you liked or what resonates with you about this framework? What about uh, things that it makes you want to know more about? Uh, we saw some good questions about just even asking about terminology. I think that's an important part of uh, working together, you know, in better or stronger different ways is just making sure we have shared understanding about some of these concepts and terms. Is there anything else that you found yourself wondering as you were hearing Rainey give the overview? Again, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand if you want to say something out loud. And so we see a question here from Peggy, is Santa Cruz County going to implement a CAHOOTS program? I don't know the answer to that right now. That's, that's, I haven't, I, I don't know who is working on that, but it's not me. And so I don't actually know if anybody else from county knows what's going on with that and can pipe up, that would be great, but I actually don't know. Yeah, I don't know either, Rainey, um, but I know that it's something that the jurisdictions at least are mulling over, like Serge mentioned last night, the city hosted this meeting and um, yeah. So long way to say, I don't know either, but I know the jurisdictions are discussing it as an option. So, so uh, is that then a city-led thing and rather than a county-led effort? That's what it seems like presently. Okay. Could I just, um, I, I could answer that, whoops. A little more conceptually, this is Kate from Focus Strategies. I think, I think the kind of taking one step up of, of, away from the granularity of cahoots specifically to just sort of thinking about what the framework says about outreach. And I think the overarching objective is for um, mobile outreach to become, uh, as Rainey mentioned, more housing focused and more problem solving oriented and um, to scale up the way that that's resourced so that the people who are going out to engage with folks who are living outside are really equipped to talk with them about a whole range of, um, of uh, strategies that can help solve their homelessness and then really bring things to um, be really be able to offer things that are things that people want and need that help them on that path to homelessness. So CAHOOTS is just one example of ways you can make your street outreach become more solution oriented, um, whether we, it's that exact model or some other kind of way of deploying, I think, is one of the things that'll be sorted out in the more granular level of developing these six month implementation plans. So I just wanted to say, I think CAHOOTS, which is a, a it's a best practice that was started in Eugene, Oregon, for people who don't know. Um, is an example of the kind of approach to outreach that I think the framework is, is trying to talk about. Thank you for that, Kate. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's just what we have learned is that the majority of our street outreach is with a health focus and that we want to have some dedicated resources to have those housing conversations with people. And it may take time, build relationship, um, you know, before someone's really ready to, to engage, at, you know, in a, in a real housing plan, but people who don't want to come in for services still need to be provided services in some way. Uh, we can't just not provide it. Um, yeah, we have another um, couple other questions here. So Melissa is asking, do you know if county departments are looking at ways to modify individual performance outcomes for nonprofit contracts in order to increase collaboration, specifically thinking about landlord engagement activities? So I'm not sure about this, the specifics of landlord engagement around that. Um, maybe you could say more about that, but uh, there are no current plans to make contract modifications, but I do think that going forward, there will be 
um, very much more specific measurable outcomes and target outcomes in contracts. I don't think that we're looking to modify existing contracts, but I do think that there will probably be much more of an emphasis on project performance as we move forward. Um, and if, if Melissa wants to speak more about the landlord engagement activities, I don't quite know what she means by that. Melissa, would you like to unmute yourself to expand oh, on that? I'm sorry. Um, uh, Hi, hello. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for letting me um, speak for a minute. So um, what I'm thinking about is, and we've kind of done a few different community-wide landlord um, activities, you know, trying to get a more collaborative approach. The contracts generally for housing service providers um, really puts you in competition with other housing service providers. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're looking on a system level, um, to really beef up landlord engagement, you know, across the community, across different programs um, and outreach form, everything else. I think if we continue having contracts that require us to be in competition for those landlords, you're just going to see more of the same. It's not going to change because mm. we can't. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Melissa. And one of the things that I would say that we're going to do, we hope to do, is actually a, a completely different approach than this community has done before, but one which other communities do with success. And that is, right now we have house, the housing navigator model where the housing navigator works with the client and they're working to try to find a house for the client. So they're combing through Craigslist and all of that. We would like the housing navigators to continue working with clients and we're certainly not going to tell them they can't look for housing, but we want to hire some real property people who are going to only look for housing and they are not going to work with clients. They are going to, their job will be to fill a pipeline that will serve the system, not a program. So the housing, it's not going to be a real property agent, for lack of a better description, attached to, you know, your rapid rehousing program or a rapid rehousing program at another agency. It's going to be, you know, when, when a program needs a house, they will be able to go to this pool and, and get housing. That's, that's the hope. Um, we're going to be following practices of other communities to stand this up. Um, the funding for it is included in the ESG CV uh, application. And in addition to the real property staff, we are gonna expand the landlord bonus signing program to not just section eight voucher holders, but anyone who's homeless, who is being worked with in the system. So whether they're going into a rapid rehousing, you know, basically if they are able to get into housing and the, the bonus is going to make a difference between the landlord signing or not, we want to, we want to use it. It helps. I, I can tell you, cause we use it for a lot of our programs when we have the funding available. Yeah. Um, it's very helpful. We should talk. We actually at FIT, we have a housing developer, development person. That's what they do is, um, work with landlords, not with the clients. Love it. Um, yeah. And I would and, love to learn more. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. We, we should talk separately about that. Let's do. Thank you. Great. So we have a couple more things coming through in the chat, things that people want to know more about. So um, from Marsa, this one is it's great that data is going to be used more robustly and strategically toward countywide goals and measuring progress towards goals. Can you talk about the integrity of data collected? I can, and what I can say is that we learned a lot when we did our data dive a year ago. Uh, we learned a lot about what data we have, what data is good, how our data quality looks, and we, we did identify that there are a lot of data integrity issues. So what we did in response to that a year ago was a major data cleanup where all providers um, went in and did the best that they could with cleaning up their data. And we are, you know, at a moment now where the homeless management information system has moved in-house to the human services department in Housing for Health. And we are going to be doing a lot more oversight and management of the whole HMIS program than ever before. And that includes 
Uh, we are expecting that every single HMIS user agency will assign a, an HMIS lead person who will participate in regular HMIS work meetings and be responsible for data quality. So we will have data quality workshops on an ongoing basis. And, you know, I can't speak to exactly how that looks like. That's, you know, it's going to get down in the weeds really quickly if I try. But what I can say is there's a commitment to using the data and getting to a place where the data is really good and we can rely on it. And we're going to be in a period maybe over this next six months to a year where there's still a lot of cleaning up to do, but I'm confident that we will get there and that a year from now we should have good data, be using it, and, and you know, contracts and all of that will rely on that data for both um, award of funding and, you know, what the target outcomes for the contracts are. I think you'll see a lot of that a year from now when we've kind of gotten through this first year with HMIS in-house and a new team of people learning about it and developing dashboards, etc. Thank you. Then this next question I'm actually going to um, give to Kate. She said that she could help answer this one. So it's a, kind of a comment and then a question uh, from Father Joseph Jacobs uh, saying that exits to housing is an assumed optimal goal. The elephant in the room is there's not enough housing in this area. One of the concepts introduced by Focus Strategies, um, which I don't feel is credible, is incentivizing programs with bonuses for exit to housing performance benchmarks. Um, and so comment is this is not automobile sales, the work we do is much more comprehensive than housing. So kind of looking for thoughts or, or responses about that. And so Kate had said that she can would you, do. Can you repeat the part about incentivizing something? What was that? Well, um, and because that's um, Father Jacobs to pipe in. I mean, I we've talked a little bit in the past about. Um, sure. Hello, everyone. Yeah, hi. So, in one of the focus strategy sessions that I attended, this concept of bonuses for agencies, like more money, more funding for meeting benchmarks for exit to housing was introduced. I don't find it credible. It's that kind of competition in this environment is not really helpful. So I don't see that in any existing contracts. We haven't introduced anything like an incentive to a provider for an exit to housing. And I'm not aware that there are plans to specifically do that. Yeah, I think I may have been the facilitator for that meeting, Father Jacobs, and I think we were talking about a range of strategies that have been used in other communities or what would make sense and getting input around do, you know, how and in what way does support to community-based agencies help. And I think your point about there's only so much that a community agency can do when the housing stock is so limited is really also reflected in the report. So it's, uh, I think the position that the framework takes is it's a both and. We need to support the capacity building for organizations and recognize that there's a resource question on that side and recognize that there's a resource question and a very large one in the housing market about what it takes for people to get housed. But I, I don't think that that as a singular potential strategy was ever captured or, or uh, supported as a specific approach. Thank you. Great, thank you all for contributing to that response there. Uh, we have another question from Serge. Can you talk about how the lived experience group will be able to give feedback? Will there be support for them to understand and participate in um, the Homeless Action Partnership meetings and board meetings, the Youth Advisory Board, uh, as he remembers it, was actually able to say yes or no to funding applications before grading. So it's kind of that question about exactly or what are some of the thoughts about how uh, the lived experience group will be participating? What, what I would say to that, Serge, is that is work to be done. Um, I don't know if you're, so actually it's, let me break that into two parts. There's, okay. there's, the feedback on the framework, which is one thing, and then there's the development of a lived experience group that's part of the COC governance, which is a second thing. With regard to feedback on the framework, we're going to be developing a 
a specific approach for the, the lived people with lived who are experiencing homelessness now, persons experiencing homelessness now, and um, that survey, it will be a survey that will be administered probably in the first two weeks of December, thereabouts, and I'm working with Brooke and with Catherine on that, and so that is coming. Um, we're not expecting people to have internet access and be able to go online. I mean, if they can, they may, and they, I would encourage them to, but if they can't, uh, we still want to get their input and, and there's specific strategies to do that. Um, longer range, when you're talking about the lived experience group, I don't know if you're talking about the group that you already are part of, or if you're talking about the envisioned group that would be part of the COC. So there are no set plans yet for what that will look like. It's part of the work plan that we will do that, that we will develop a recommendation for a group that will be part of the COC. It's not defined yet. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, and then we have another question here about who is the outward facing contact from Housing for Health for HMIS needs? Are there any new trainings coming up other than the self-guided videos? Jessica Shiner is your contact. Great, thank you for that. And you can also, I, I don't have the address handy, but anybody with any question about HMIS, whether it's training, a license or anything, can email the BitFocus help desk. I just don't happen to have that address handy. Yeah, and I just want to add, Stacy Holmes has been working with us. We've been um, meeting weekly talking about data. And um, I know she's been engaged with a couple different service providers. And so she's really accessible and wants to help. So do not hesitate to reach out. Mm -hmm. And then we were also curious, again, because so much of CORE, as I said in the beginning, is about really trying to connect across sectors and find the linkages between all of our different areas of work. And so we're curious, just how do you all see your work intersecting or supporting the goals and strategies that Rainey described in the, um, in the new strategic framework for addressing homelessness? You think about your role, your areas of interest, your passions, where do you see the intersection? How do you see yourselves contributing to or supporting the implementation of this plan? You know, some of you on this call are actual service providers. What other ways might your roles intersect or support this plan? Hopefully that leaves you with some food for thought. That, uh, cause I think this will be um, the very nature of implementing the plan, right? To continue looking for those connections and that synergy and, uh, and, and uh, the county, it sounds like is very committed to creating those opportunities mm -hmm. for those partnerships and uh, creativity. So I think that'll be, um, Really valuable, and 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 Rainy, you're welcome back anytime Thank for you. you know a follow up on on this and kind of keep us posted about how One things thing are going. One thing I forgot to to really go into any detail about is that one of the one of the downfalls of our prior plan was that there really wasn't an implementation plan. There were a lot of things to be done and a lot of um, you know measurable targets and things, but there wasn't really any sense of what was important, what was prioritized. Um, you know, who should work on what. Uh, it was just a list, of, a huge list of, of to-dos, basically. Um, this plan is going to be backed up by a rapid cycle six-month work plan every six months. So it's going to be a plan, do, study, act. Uh, we are already in the process of implementing what we're calling work plan zero, which goes through December, and then we will be developing a second six-month work plan to support the framework, uh, and that will be part of what we roll out in January. And figuring out this work of how to involve our partners um, to have co-leads and people embedded in the work is really critical going forward, and we're, we're in the process of noodling some of that out. 
And, uh, you know, I think that how people see themselves integrating into this work is something we're very interested in knowing about. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, getting information out to everybody on the web page where you can read more, complete the survey, and, you know, kind of give us some feedback. So I wanted to say thank you to the Nicoles for inviting me to present this information this morning. And hello, and, and nice to see all the faces of people I haven't seen in a while. Um, so it's really nice to connect with everybody. And, you know, there's more to come. This is, as I said, we're in public comment. This is not a finished product, but we are very excited about it. And I really do think that there's a lot here that is going to make a big difference. And, you know, the, diff the moment that we're in combines, you know, a really clear plan with available funding and administrative staffs to support the work. So, you know, the, the, the key missing component is going to be our community partners, our jurisdictions, all of the external stakeholders that will be critical to getting the work done. So I'm excited. I've actually said, I'm psyched <laughs> to a few people because I actually really am. Um, I think that this is an amazing moment. So thank you. Thank you, Rainey, for all your work. And it's great to see you smile. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Agreed. Um, Rainey, there's a question in here about um, whether the, there's any projected work with planning departments, either the cities and, and county for construction of tiny houses. Tiny houses are something that I have definitely expressed a great deal of interest about in the past, and I've hit some very, very hard, hard walls on that. <laughs> um, and so, yes, I think there will be more work done. I don't know that I will lead that work, but I do think that our planning departments will lead that work. And I do know that the county has a new supervisor coming on board who's very interested in tiny houses. So that may generate some, some energy around there. Um, as to working with planning departments generally, yes, um, working with planning departments right now on funding applications on various things. So. Uh, they're very, very important partners. I uh, do hope that we will see strong partnerships with both the county and city's planning departments going forward. And, and related to that, just the, the various zoning issues about limiting construction, um, density sorts of things. Those are, again, I mean, they're going to be policy issues. We're not tackling those specifically in this plan, but they will be I would lump that into the assumptions section of external issues that will influence our ability to be successful. Okay, thanks. And in response to the question about how people's work intersects with, with all of the, the planning work, we've got some comments from um, about some of the Safe Spaces Parking Program, for example, and then some diversion work. Um, so lots of things coming in in the chat that speak to that. Um, that's, that's really good to see. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Give people another chance to weigh in either with, with questions or some observations about how all this work connects um, or just the, the excitement and enthusiasm about moving forward. So we have a few more minutes here and it's an opportunity to ask each other questions or pose questions to, to Rainey and the Focus Strategies team. But meanwhile, Rainey, I just wondered if you had any other uh, closing thoughts or reflections before we officially transition to some wrap-up questions here. Well, I guess I would say that <clears throat> this it has been um, a really interesting time that we've all come through. And you know, the work that we've done with focus strategies over the last 18 months has really helped, I think, our community look objectively at what we're good at and what we're not good at and think about best <clears throat> practices and think about how we can take what we're already doing and do it better. And then how we can recognize where we just flat out have gaps and what we need to do to fill them. So I feel really, really good that we have 
um, some outside perspective that helped us, you know, kind of examine our own navels <laughs> and, and really think about what we, what we as a system want our system to, you know, what is a community do we want our homeless response system to look like? Um, and, and I feel it's been a really, really rich, meaningful discussion with many of you over the last 18 months, looking at your programs, talking to you about your work, hearing what your experience on the ground is. Um, I feel that we've really, really looked at it thoroughly and learned a lot and know what we're doing and how to get there, you know, know what we need to do and, and how we need to get there. Um, to me, that's a really positive feeling. And, uh, you know, I just, I kind of want everybody to ride on this wave of, if we can all just get in this boat right now, we can do it. So please, if there's an ask or if you see an opportunity, you know, these are stretch goals. So if everybody can stretch, and I know we're all stretched already, but just, let's just all keep stretching. Sounds good. Appreciate the uh, surfing boating analogy too. <laughs> appropriate for our area. Um, so a couple more questions are coming in about um, specifically about feedback during the public comment period, um, the ways to do that. I know we've got a couple of the upcoming Zoom meetings listed in our next slide, which I'll share in just a moment. But do you want to add anything about other ways that people can provide feedback, um, emails so or? The specific or method that we're using for the feedback is the... Um, is the, is the survey tool that we're gonna have on the HAP website. So there will be on the HAP website, a systems change page. And on that systems change page will be all of the focus strategies materials for, for the things that they've developed for us in the past that inform this framework. Um, this framework is a product of the county. So we're thankful to the HAP for hosting this work product there. Um, Emails, you know, there are hundreds of people invited to participate. So emails are not really practical. We would just be flooded. Um, so what I would suggest is use the survey tool. Um, if you feel that you are not able to provide a full enough response there, um, then maybe make a comment to that effect and we'll see, you know, I, I think Kate and Catherine, as we think about finalizing the survey, we need to think about a way that people can provide some uh, non-scripted responses, i.e. not just yes, no, ABC, so that people can, can provide free text response. I think that's probably the best strategy because we really do need to collect it all in one place um, and not have it scattered around. Okay. Um, so I'll just, if I could just add Thank on to that. Um, so the web page that Rainey is describing on the HAP website, which will be, um, I think, live fairly in, in short order, will also, I mean, I think the centerpiece of that is you will be actually able to read the draft framework, which is a document. Um, it's, I don't think, you know, it's, it's not super long, but it's definitely, um, you know, it's got a lot more of the technical detail in it of what uh, was in the PowerPoint that you just saw. Um, and as Randy mentioned, also all the backup materials, the analytics work that Focus Strategies has done that support it. And then the survey, um, which is almost finalized, does have a fair amount of opportunity for people to give um, free form feedback, as well as sort of yes, no, and rate on a scale of one to five kinds of questions. So it's, it's a mix of um, multiple choice and text response. So, um, and as Rennie says, that's our preferred method for taking comment because we can take it all in a in a parallel structure. And then when we go to report out on the feedback we got, it's easier to synthesize it when everyone's answering the same set of questions. Okay, great. So yeah, once I, that's would, I would say, please do not email me. Um, please just wait till we get the link of the survey out to you. Okay, so stay tuned for the survey link and we'll do our best to publicize it as well. And then I just wanted to note uh, Father Joseph Jacob's comment in the chat about the interest in a mobile behavioral health unit or team that can visit different shelters that may not have their own in-house behavioral health staff. So that's 
um, very needed. And I think that that is continuing to be a work in progress. That's something, honestly, that we've been working on as a system for a pretty long time. And it's, you know, we're, I can't speak to what resources our behavioral health department can commit, but I know that there's ongoing conversations. Okay. All righty. Well, let me share my screen again. And just talk a little bit about things that are coming up. So two more upcoming, very upcoming um, opportunities for feedback. So another presentation tomorrow afternoon, um, and then again on Thursday in the evening. So um, we'll put some links to that in, in the chat. Um, for CORE, speaking for the, the CORE chats and events, we will be taking a brief break over the Thanksgiving holiday and immediately afterwards in terms of CORE chats. But then in December, we'd like to invite people to join us for a, a winter resource fair. We'd like to set up a time where people um, across the county can share what they're doing um, in terms of services and how those are delivered and particularly the, the equity dimensions of that work. Um, maybe in 10 minute or so presentations. So if you're interested, potentially interested in doing that, let one of the Nicoles know, but we'll, we'll issue a more formal invitation with, with dates and ideas for that soon. And then we'd also like to offer um, the following week on the 15th of December, just to wrap up the year, an informational session about a virtual facilitation academy that we're planning to try to build capacity to do meetings like this, um, bilingual meetings, um, to have lots of breakout session facilitators who could help facilitate larger sessions because we're probably gonna be sheltering in place for a while yet, despite the good news on vaccines. It'll take a while for all that to be distributed. So we wanna, while we're all doing this and maybe even beyond to have more access to these kinds of meetings. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, we'll present something in December and that will probably start up early in the new year. So uh, we welcome your interest in that and participation in that. And the, the, more, the more of these kinds of sessions that we can open up to, to more uh, groups in our community, the better. And then finally, um, Nicole will put a link in the chat to a survey. We really take your feedback seriously. It really helps us, especially since we have this ongoing set of uh, chats and conversations. So we really wanna know what worked for you and what didn't and what your ideas are for us. So please do take the time to fill that out. And thanks again to Rainey, to Kate and to Catherine for all the work behind this um, this report and framework and to all of you for attending and providing your feedback today. We really appreciate having these, these opportunities to chat and to have a conversation and we look forward to seeing you again at a future CORE Coffee Chatter conversation. Thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.